afternoon, Mitch. We have been on kind of what seems to have been a roller coaster ride the last couple of years with interest rates. And that's going to be our topic of conversation today. What's going on with interest rates? What do we maybe anticipate happening and how that's impacting buyers, right? What, what's happening there? So for those that, that don't know Mitch, Mitch is with Pivot Lending Group. We're doing these monthly reviews as mortgages are, are consistently uh, one of our, our strongest partners in, in real estate, right? We can't do most of what we do without mortgages. Um, and it impacts more than just those buying homes. As a seller, you have to be aware of what's happening on the mortgage side because that's going to impact how much you can sell your home for and, and what the process looks like. So, um, Mitch, go ahead and, uh, and introduce yourself for those that don't know. Uh, who you are and, and kind of what you do. You got it. Great. Thanks. Well, happy to be here again in our monthly visits uh, that we see each other outside of these visits. Nice to get together and talk shop for a little while. Um, I'm Mitch Friedman. I've been in Colorado for the last 28 years providing home loans from a professional standpoint to many, many thousands of home buyers over those years. And um, one day I'll go back and see how many loans I've actually closed over that span of time. It'll be interesting to see. Um, interestingly enough, everything is about the same as far as documentation and things we do for our business. We just have technology to, to help make things move a little quicker in some cases. Um, Pivot Lending Group is based out of Littleton, Colorado. We're a direct mortgage banker and we uh, provide just all different kinds of financing options and programs for new home buyers, investor buyers, uh, one to four unit uh, uh, um, like a duplex or triplex or fourplex. So uh, really cover the spectrum on the residential side. We do not handle any commercial type of financing. And um, it's a great industry. We're in interesting times in our real estate um, profession. And the market is interesting, which we'll talk a little bit more about, as well as interest rates and the Fed and uh, why we are where we are and where we think we're gonna end up, hopefully in the next 24 months to um, hopefully see rates come down a little bit which would be our hope. Yeah, yeah that, that would be good to see. Um, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, I'm going to rely on your expertise. So and before we dive into that, I've got a question for you. I'm going to put you on the spot. I just threw this up on my Facebook page. So it's a would you rather question. All right. So would you rather give up air conditioning and heating for the rest of your life or give up the internet for the rest of your life? Oh, uh, they both provide some conveniences and comfort. <laughs> so good question. I would say if I didn't have to communicate through email, I think I would give up internet and enjoy the heat and the, the, the uh, cooling down when it's warm as far as living here in Colorado. Yeah, However, I, think, <laughs> I think it depends on, uh, one, where I'm living and, and two, what I'm, what I'm doing to earn my income right now within, right. uh, Real estate internet's probably essential, uh, it, it and is. I can survive without the air conditioning. I don't know about our Colorado winters and surviving without, you know, forced yeah. air heat. That's correct. So, good, funny question. I like that one. Yeah. So, nice. what's happening with with mortgage rates? We're hearing a lot about them going up and the impact that that's having on on buyers and, and being able to buy yeah. homes. Yeah, it's um, it's been a very and we use the term parabolic move, which thing which means the interest rates have risen extremely quickly in a very short amount of time. So if you can envision looking at some graph and you see the shape of a hockey stick, you've got the the bottom of I don't know what you call it, the bottom of the hockey stick uh, is very kind of flat, and then all of a sudden it just goes straight up for the actual part you hold on the stick. And that's really what mortgage rates have done in such a short amount of time. And in the, in the time I've been doing home loans and mortgage banking, never have I seen this kind of movement this quickly, which is consistent with never seeing and living through a pandemic and the effects on the economy and all the money that was given to everybody and many people from a standpoint of trying to keep things afloat for them from, from a financial standpoint that the government gave out. And so these are part of the repercussions, in my opinion, of handing out and providing financial support as was needed, but there is some, some impact at some point and the impact has basically been inflation. And it's inflation that's causing rates to move to the levels they have um, from a mortgage standpoint. 
And as we know, it's not just mortgages that have gone up from an inflationary standpoint. It's just about everything we do on a daily basis has become more expensive. Um, wherever you end up going, you, you'll, you see it, you notice it, and uh, you see it in fuel prices, you see it at the grocery store, you go out for dinner and they have this surcharge of 20%. I've, I've seen in all these different restaurants and like, is that the tip? And they're like, well, you could call it that, but no, it's just a, a pace of living expense or some, they put some unusual uh, wording on the, on the receipt. Uh, but yes, it's in lieu of a tip, but point being, things have, have dramatically increased in cost. Well, let me know where those restaurants are so that I can plan ahead of time as, as I'm going there. Now, you know, I I don't think the comments are, are like whether we should have or shouldn't have, have given money during those times. Everything has unintended consequences. And these are some of the unintended consequences that we see from just kind of the practice that, that was there, you know, right or wrong. Can't go back in time and do it differently to say, hey, this is how it could have gone. Um, but we are seeing dramatic inflation and that's having an impact at the grocery store, at the gas pump for real estate prices. And correct me if I'm wrong, the Fed wants to slow that down so that we're not just having wild inflation uh, happening in our country. Correct. And, and it, it's doing its job in a very, very quick way. And the, the uh, information I read this morning is indicating that they're going to continue to do this. Someone I saw uh, mentioned, someone high up in the areas that has influence over rates, says they could raise the rate, the and it's called the federal discount rate, not mortgage rates, um, three quarters of 1% at their next meeting, instead of a half, which is what was predicted. And actually those comments cause mortgage rates to increase again today, based on those particular comments of future rate hikes, but larger than expected. And I, I think what they're trying to do is cut this off at the pass, hit hard, make their point quickly so that things don't get too crazy and out of control, and then reel back after that point when they fear, the next fear is recession, <laughs> which comes right after the inflation. And, and it's such a tough balancing act. And I do not know enough about economic information to tell you more than that comment. What I do know is the influence it's having is um, very, very um, concerning uh, within our industry. And I'll just keep it to that for this conversation uh, because I'm speaking to a lot of people who say that the homes rising in appreciation and interest rates rising at the same time, it's made it very challenging from an affordability standpoint. And um, it's not that people aren't still buying homes, but it has definitely priced some people out of a home that they ordinarily would have liked to have purchased. And maybe now they're looking at condominiums or townhomes instead. So they're not going away. They're just looking at different types of property. Yeah, I, I think people still want to get into home ownership. And if that means I don't get to live in the, you know, the big house, I get to live in a smaller house or I don't get to have the detached house. It, it's going to be a townhome to start. They're, they're changing some of that. And, and some other folks are just sitting on the sidelines and saying, well, if I can't have what I want, I'm not going to move forward. Right. Um, you know, we had chatted with a, a buyer who was looking last year and the interest rates knocked off about $100,000 of their approval. At the same time, the prices went up. So the, the homes they had available to them a year ago in the price point they could afford are gone, right? They, they're not their price point. They're not even a, anywhere in the ballpark of what it could be. And they're looking at significantly different types of real estate if they want to move forward. Correct. And that's what we're seeing quite a bit of. Um, but you know, this leads me to think of a few conversations I've had recently with people where they're actually looking to purchase with other people instead of just by themselves, because the affordability becomes more affordable. It makes more sense. And this way, two people aren't renting and paying a, a lot of rent. They actually could buy a home together. And that's been a new dynamic that I actually didn't really even think about until I had two calls for that. I said, well, this makes sense. This could be the, the, new, the new potential first-time home buyer pool of, of buyers where it's two people. It was two individual people. So I don't know if there's going to be like couples that are going to do it together, but that could happen too. Uh, families for sure are doing it with grandparents and parents and children and vice versa. We're seeing a lot of that as well. So we just might see multiple buyers for one property now, just to keep it affordable. 
Yeah, that, that was interesting. I asked that question to a friend of mine here recently. You know, if you could go back in time or you weren't married, didn't have kids, is this something you would consider moving in with uh, a friend that you had confidence in, right? Faith in, you, sure. you knew that they were going to pay their half of it. Would you consider that? Uh, and their response was, no, that, that, that wouldn't be something they would consider. Uh, going back into my 20s and, and I was fortunate enough to buy young, it's probably something that I would have considered as a, as a young bachelor. I had roommates anyways. So if that's what it took to get into home ownership, I probably would have considered that. And I think that's an interesting solution for those who want to get into home ownership and uh, you know, don't, don't think they can afford it on their own. Right. For sure. And and that is a unique experience to be able to go down that road together with a friend or a partner. If you're in a relationship and you and your partner I just had clients yesterday, bought a home together, but they weren't married and their their plans are to be, but they wanted to buy a home because they saw what was going on in the marketplace. So it worked out really well for them. Well, I love my mom and I love my dad without a doubt. I don't want to be living in the same house. Um, you know, and nothing against spending time with either one of them. But right. uh, that's, uh, I moved out of the house at a, at a young age. Uh, you know, I have no intention of moving back or, or having to go the other way. Now, now I would, right? Situations dictated, I would absolutely have my parents move in with me or vice right. versa. But if, if I can help it. Right. Uh, you and, know, you know, yeah, I, I agree. But we are seeing more of that. And I'm seeing three generations of people living together. The grandparents, the kids, and the grandchildren so that the grandparents could be with the grandchildren and watch them while parents go to work. Yeah. And they yeah, can buy a, home, a beautiful home that, that would do a million dollars or $800,000, but together they can all afford it. Well, I think it's great, right? Absolutely. For those that, that it fits into that family dynamic. And, right. um, you know, I've, I've got friends that are doing it now, some neighbors that are, are set up that way. And, and it's great for them. We've got, uh, you know, family members as well. You know, wouldn't wouldn't mind built-in babysitters for my son, but uh, you know that's that that's okay. Different uh, different problem for it as as we solve that. Right, right. So, um, you know, some of the things that I've been uh, working with with people is alternative loan programs from a mortgage rate standpoint. Um, from a, and I'm gonna kind of jump to the higher level prices in the jumbo loan jumbo mortgage standpoint which would mean loan amounts roughly up around $650,000 or higher. Um, due to the fact that jumbo mortgages are more restrictive and they're typically uh, have, to, have to fall into higher qualification guidelines, a little bit more restrictive, the risk level is lower for people buying in that category. So they provide them with lower interest rates. That's what history has shown them. And they're also not being sold to associations called Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, mm -hmm. uh, or even Jenny Mae, which is FHA or government loans. And so we're seeing those interest rates running a half percent to three quarters of a percent lower than your typical Fannie Mae loan program. And that's just on the 30 year fixed level. And now we're even talking about, again, adjustable rate mortgages. And those are coming back in style because they are lower than 30 year fixed rates. And we're seeing those also with Fannie Mae loans as well. We are seeing a, a fairly nice reduction in the interest rate. Um, and that just makes it a little bit more comfortable for people to be in the mid 4% interest, mid 4% range, uh, high 3% ranges on some of the shorter term adjustable rate mortgages. But there are some alternatives to just considering 30 year fixed rates, with, which is what we all did for. I mean, for 20 years, 15 years, because it just made sense. And now it makes sense to look at that in addition to these adjustable rate loans. And it's been great to have provided as an offering as an alternative for buyers who have not even thought about it. In fact, they never even knew it existed because maybe they didn't even buy a home until then, never discussed those. Um, so they are new, the new talk right now when we speak with our clients is, is this a home you're gonna live in for more than five years or 10 years if not, maybe you want to consider one of these kind of loans to help save on the monthly payment and the lower interest rate. So it's been it's been nice, nice to reintroduce them as long as the client understands them, because it's very important to not get yourself in, in uh, into uh, financial concerns if a rate should move up on you after this fixed rate period goes by. 
So it's um, just a nice alternative. And we haven't, like I said, haven't talked about it in years. So yeah, have a plan in place, understand what it is, what it isn't, how to utilize the tool. And I think about, you know, my, my dad's toolbox, he's got a whole bunch of tools in there. He knows and understands how to use. If I went into his toolbox and I just started grabbing something random, it doesn't, it's the same tool, but it doesn't mean that I have the same skill with it or same understanding and it doesn't do the same, the same thing in my hands, right? So to speak. Correct. So uh, being educated. Now, now you said something I'm, I'm curious about and, and I don't have the data on this, right? But the jumbo loan option has some better rate, right? For those that qualify. I'm curious the impact it's going to have that the raising interest rates for the properties that are not quite to the jumbo level, mm -hmm. but but are close enough to to kind of get squeezed into the middle. Are we you know maybe going to see those prices come down a little bit where we see the jumbo loan home options maybe sustain a little bit? Is there going to be some sort of you know, compression within that market? And I don't know if you can you know speak to that if you've got a, an opinion on it. If I'm way off base, but but just kind of a question, a follow-up question that I would have on that is I yeah. would look at the data and say, hey, what, what happened? Right. So I don't know the data, but what I can tell you, it brings up a very valid point. And here's, there's two, two parts to it. Um, the first part is if, if, if the, property, the properties that are in the jumbo loan category uh, and that's providing a lower interest rate to people, I think that market might still hold stronger because even though there's fewer homes at those price levels, there's as many home buyers that can actually afford those properties. Uh, there's huge demand right now and there's still bidding wars on million, $2 million properties. And um, it's interesting to see that that's taking place, but not that it's due to rates, but there's they're being less impacted by the interest rate increase relative to that little kind of nook area that I think maybe you're talking about of if you ended up at a six hundred and forty or six hundred and seventy-five thousand dollar mortgage, and you bought a seven seventy-five home, you're very close to the jumbo loan, which is just over six hundred and eighty-four thousand. My thought when you said that, which was the way I thought you were going to go, because this is how you think, Matt, and I know how you think now, is well, why don't we just buy a six hundred a fifty thousand dollar more expensive home with the exact same payment because you get the lower rate. And that I think is a great talking point with clients to say, I'm not trying to push you higher. What I'm trying to show you is you can buy a more expensive home for the exact same cost and payment, be just due to the difference between a jumbo loan and a non-jumbo loan, assuming they qualify for both. Yeah, without a doubt. And I think because of that, we may see some downward compression on those homes in that kind of, lack of a better term, dead space. Right. Because it's, well, my payment's going to be the same if I buy this one that's $50,000 more. So let's buy that one. Now there's got to be a bigger gap than the 50000 right. to entice somebody to buy a, a lesser home. Yeah. Some of that will be uh, dictated by cash availability because you can still put 5% down on a Fannie Mae loan at those levels. Yep. Or the jumbo loan, you're typically putting 20% down. So um, I think there's still a market for that, but I, I think it's a, a great thought process for a home buyer to consider their actual price limit based on what we just talked about. I think it's a really, really good strategy and concept to present to our buyer clients. I think a lot of little nuances that it's not just uh, one aspect that you need to look at. You need to look at the, the picture as a whole. And we Correct. do that on both sides. As we That's list correct. homes, what do we need to know about mortgages to put us in the best spot? As we're buying homes, how does that impact us as well? Right, exactly, yep. So um, interest rates are it have been going up. Are you anticipating and hearing they're gonna continue to go up and uh, are they gonna stop? Well, I was a really poor predictor of this about six to eight months ago and I said four and a half to five, maybe. <laughs> And of course, blew right by that. Um, so my, my new prognostication on that is probably somewhere up to six to maybe a little over six. Um, there are some people who are actually going into the sixes currently based on lower credit scores. So it's not an unheard of. 
right now, and some of the uh, down payment assistance programs are also in the 6% category. So that's that's new, haven't seen a six in a very, very long time. Um, I think based on right now, we're, we're in that five to five and a half percent range, whether you're doing a, a conventional loan or an FHA or a VA loan or a USDA loan, there are all these different options. They're in that general category that spread right now. So I think if we jump from five and a quarter to six, that, that's going to be another large jump, but we may get there this year, actually. And then we tend to see these cycles of higher rates in a short amount of time with the increase, maybe hover there for a 24 month period. So from the starting of when the rates started going up, which is really mostly like January 3rd through a 24 month period, we then may see some tapering off depending on what's going on geopolitically and all our own economy and uh, see where that ends up. And, and the good and the bad news is from there, we may see uh, an opportunity to help people refinance again uh, in a couple of years. And so it's interesting. I'm getting more people saying to me, I can afford this payment. I'd rather not do it, but I can afford it because I know I'm going to now refinance in two years. And my, my comment is, if the opportunity presents itself, by all means, we will refinance with you. But it's hard to bank on that you will refinance because what if it never comes down for five years? Uh, make sure you can still afford the payment today. So, uh, so that's what a lot of people are thinking, a couple year cycle. I, I looked at buying homes and saying, okay, if life dictated, I had to stay here for 25 years, could I, could I do that? Is that gonna work? Or did I just, hey, sacrifice down, this can only be a six month home option or a two year option or whatever that is. And I think that served me well in making decisions in buying real estate and some advice that I give clients as well. And that's a conversation that you would have to have around banking on something happening in the future because none of us were banking on a pandemic and then inflation the way that it came. So speculation, I think can get people into trouble right. when you're banking on something happening in the future. If it doesn't happen that way and you're without a paddle, that that's a tough spot to be in. Now, if you have exit strategies, you've got things accounted for if they go up or change, and I think you can move forward with those tools and understanding you're probably in a pretty good spot. Certainly. And that's where the reserve account comes into play, in my opinion. <clears throat> to come in with no available funds left over after you buy a home definitely puts you in a spot of, oops, something happened we didn't expect six months from now. And that's a, a, it's a, it's a challenging situation to be in. So um, we do try to coach that. It's not always the case that it's a, it's a reality. But we do try to provide and say having reserves is important. We don't want to tap out all your liquid funds to buy a home if 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 we don't need to, <clears throat> or they may have a 401k or something like that. Yeah. So. So the interest rates going up, we're heading, you know, five, five and a half, heading towards six. I know from 1990 to today, the, that average for the interest rate was about six, just a shade under. Historical average being 8%, we're still pretty good even at six. You've been doing this in Colorado for 28 years, 24 years? Yep. Got 20 it, 28. Years. Um, <coughs> interest rates have, have been a little bit higher than that in the time that you've been doing this. Does this mean Without people aren't gonna be buying homes? No, um, but, and I don't wanna put a, a spin on the reality, but home prices are different today than they were then. However, so are people's income levels. So there's there's you know, there's this stepping ladder of home prices, interest rates, income, interest rates come down, home prices stabilize, rates go back up. You know, there's there's just kind of there's a balancing act that takes place, and I still think it comes back to comfort level and affordability uh, from from the standpoint of owning a home. And, and as you and I talked about, have talked about many times is, it's all about having a course of roof over your head, but building a net worth for yourself and creating something down the line. Because if you are, a, if you're renting and only renting because you feel like the market's too frothy or high, interest rates are too high, and I think they're gonna come down in the future and you continue to pay rent, it, it from a net worth standpoint, it doesn't, propel you to the next level. It actually puts you behind just because of appreciation and rates increasing. 
Um, so there's a lot of things to take into consideration based on where you where a, a buyer is looking to position themselves from a financial standpoint as well. I had a conversation with uh, with somebody here recently, and they said, "Well, I'm going to wait for the interest rates to come down before I before I buy a property." So, well, okay, what if they don't come down? Right. What if they continue to go up? One of the amazing things about real estate is our frequent ability to refinance if the interest rates get better. So if I buy at six, the interest rates go down, I can take advantage of it going down. That seems like a good deal to me. Yes. Yep. And at least you have that option at that point. Yeah. If you're yeah, so. But if, yeah, but if I'm the, renting, the, I don't get that option. The, the landlord wants more money next year. There we go. And, and somebody once told me the interest rate on renting is a hundred percent. Yes, it sure is. With <laughs> very little tax, interest rate. very little tax deductions. Yeah, no, no benefits there, right, on, on that right. side of it. So Correct. you know, even at six percent, eight percent, that's still a whole lot lower than a hundred percent. That's correct. That's correct. So, yeah. yeah. So I, you know, there's just there's so many different program selections that cause rates to be higher, lower down payment requirements, cause the rates to be higher or lower, credit scores, um, closing dates, all sorts of variables have an impact on mortgage rates. And, and like if I was a consumer or a client who wanted to buy a home and I've never owned a home before, if I went online to, to just look up, what are mortgage rates today for me? It would be so overwhelming and confusing because there are so many variables that come into play to be able to say to someone very specifically, Here's your what your interest rate would be today if you were buying a home and under contract and closing in the next 30 days. There's just a lot of moving parts. So uh, it would be tough. And you know, that's your job, that's my job, is to make sure we provide good information to our clients to say, hey, some I've had people come in and say, I heard rates are at six and a quarter, and I've heard people say I heard rates are at three and a quarter still. And I'm I've said, well, you got the high end covered and the low end covered, but let's talk about really where it's at now. Yeah. And um, it's it's what we are here to do and make sure people are, when they're making decisions about buying a home, which is a very large, important decision, that the facts are there to be able to make that decision in a, in a way that makes sense and is well informed. And um, if anybody has those kinds of questions for you or I, you know, we're available to do that. That's what we do all day long is uh, help provide information to make good good educated decisions and um it, we have we yet to, to go back with the client and say you know you probably shouldn't have bought that home four or five years ago because they said thank goodness i was able to buy that home four or five years ago and you guys helped coach me along the way to make it uh, make me understand what i was doing and that i could afford and be comfortable with this this property and it's proven out over and over and over over the last 30, 40 years that I've been doing mortgage banking, but it's it's never not proven itself out over a span of time. There were definitely some years that you would say selling today might not be the best idea. Um, and it turned around and just whipsawed right back up the other side and it got even more valuable, the property. So things happen and uh, owning a home is really one of the things that could propel Comfort, net worth, future future retirement. I mean, all sorts of things that it can provide that we just can't save that kind of money that fast. So, so many benefits when it comes to net worth, options, opportunities with owning a home that, that when you don't own a home, you just don't have those options. And there's right. a, um, a, a famous author and speaker out there that says, hey, don't buy a home because it's a bad decision. You know, you got to buy real estate for other people to live in. And I agree to buying and owning real estate that other people live in. I just don't agree with don't buy your own home. I think for most of us, wealth starts with owning your own home. Um, you know, can you utilize that strategy as a springboard into uh, into the future, right? Into sure. creating more net worth. Yeah. And I had options as a homeowner early in my 20s. That, that my friends who were renting just didn't have, you know, I was able to do things that, that they just weren't able to do. And my cost of living was significantly lower owning a home than, than it was uh, renting. Right. And right. for those that are renting. So. 
Sure. And then you build up the, the equity in the home. Then you could take that and go buy, a, like you were talking about, buy a home for other people to live in. What you're speaking of is investment properties. Yeah. And I've had clients do that over and over. And it's just, it's a wonderful thing to watch and see them uh, be able to, to do what they want to do in that respect from an investing standpoint. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you have a family, you could leave it to your family. I mean, there's so many things that you can do with real estate and equity and um, long-term plans with it. It is an investment vehicle and you can leverage it wonderfully. Buy dirt, they're not making more of it, out, outside right. of Dubai and you know, that's that's a whole nother story, right? But they're not making more dirt. So you buy something that they're not making any more of, you you have that ownership and, and fantastic. So right. here's, a, here's a question for you, Mitch, and I'm gonna put you into a state where you know what you know, you have the experience that you know, but let's say you're not in mortgage. Today, mm -hmm. Mitch retired and he's, he doesn't financially benefit any way from this, from the answer to this question. Okay. Do you think it's a bad time today to, to get a mortgage with the mortgage rates increasing to buy the real estate with the prices the way that it's going? So I answer that in two ways. Um, if, if you were my brother and I was your brother, I would tell us we need to go buy a home each or together <laughs> um, because I fully am a believer in, uh, in wealth creation and I don't see any other vehicles that I can afford. If I can come in and put 3% down to buy a home, in some cases, no money down with down payment assistance and leverage a $500,000 piece of real estate. I could never do that in any other capacity, no matter what you present to me. That's that's how my mind would think, given that question and how I would look at, is this a right thing or good decision to make for me? I would do my due diligence and look up, in my opinion, history of mortgage rates to see, well, really, where are we relative to mortgage rates over the time they've been tracked? And it's been about 35, 40 years they've tracked them. Um, and to your comments about the average rates, well, we're still well below the 8% interest rates. And if I get lucky and rates drop, I can refinance. Um, so as long as I can afford that property, which is the key to all of it, I, it would be the first thing I would jump into, whether I had a few dollars available for down payment or none, as long as I could qualify for those kinds of special programs. So without a doubt. and that's what I tell my kids. So I, I'm living, I do it. So by the way, I do it and I've done it. And they're, they're, they're on their way and doing those types of things. And I would tell that to anybody I talk to um, that it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? I, I don't think there's a bad time to buy the right piece of property. Right? You, you can buy the right deal at the right price and, and things work out really well. And over time, it's proven that Hey, we're, we're going to create wealth. We're going to create net worth from owning real estate and the opportunities, the flexibility that owning real estate gives you is far beyond what it is for renting. But I think it makes sense. Now, I, I think the first average first time home buyer is now kind of in that mid to lower 30s, 33, 34 years old, maybe 35. I was 23 when I bought my first house. So clearly I thought about it that way. Mm -hmm. And I talked to friends of mine at that time said, you need to buy real estate. You need to buy real estate. It's a good time to buy real estate. Uh, who didn't buy real estate until about five years ago right. and dramatically different change. Now let's flash forward and picture we're having this conversation, you know, 12 years from now, right? Mitch, Yep. Do, do we think it's we will have regretted owning real estate over those 12 years? We said the odds are pretty small. I, I would agree. I would agree. Yep. Um, so, we may not see this, again, parabolic move in valuation increases by any means um, because I just don't think the market will allow for it to continue that way. Um, but I still think there'll be appreciation. And, you know, even I, I was actually in a meeting today where the forget how many years of we were looking at for appreciation, the average appreciation, even with today's in the last couple of years increases was about 6%. And even at 6% on $500,000, that's $30,000 a year that you don't have to go to work for. 
it just is working for you. And you're getting income tax benefits from paying a mortgage and private home ownership, and then the ability maybe to leverage that into another investment property or a investment property at a later time with appreciation and things like that. So it's still, it's just a tool that you can use in many different ways. And you can't, nothing, again, nothing else I can think of that allow you to do that unless you're extremely wealthy and you've got a large portfolio of money in a stock market and you could borrow against that to go do something different. Uh, tra trading in futures in the stock market and shorting the go. market here, doing that, it's uh, very complicated, way beyond my understanding. Yet uh, real estate, I know because you're not making any more of it. It goes up over time. It goes up, it goes down, but consistently it's going up. Uh, relatively safe investment considering <clears throat> I can borrow the money. And you know, we talked about this this morning in a, in a mastermind group that I was in. If I had a hundred thousand dollars liquid cash, hundred thousand dollars, and I went and I put it in the market, and the market went up ten percent, I got one hundred and ten thousand dollars. If I put it into the real estate market, twenty percent down on a on a five hundred thousand dollar home, and the market goes up ten percent, well, that's great, five hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So I made fifty thousand dollars on my hundred thousand dollar investment. And that doesn't take into account what it looks like from uh, the tax benefits, right? right. Um, sure. The being able to write off the interest rate, the other things you can do in and around the home. It's also one of those, I get to buy it at a discount sometimes. There's always homes I can buy at a discount. I can't go to the market and go buy Apple stock for 80% of its, of its face value. That, that's not an option. It, unless Mitch, you know differently, in which case let's have a conversation and tell me how you did it. Mm -hmm. But but you can buy a piece of property that's 80% of its retail value and put some forced appreciation into it. And mm -hmm. and there you go. So again, long, long answer to it. I don't think there's a bad time to buy the right piece of property. Right. I think it's always a risky decision to be over leveraged to buy anything. Correct. Yep, I agree with that. And that's part of our, our job and our fiduciary responsibility to our clients is making sure they don't get in over their heads with information. They ultimately make those decisions, but we still should have some influence on providing good information to talk about the what ifs. What if someone loses a job? What if you get hurt on the job? What if your company goes out of business? Um, what if you have to move to a different location and help family? Can you can you rent the home out so you can still keep it as this wonderful investment? Can you rent it out and feel comfortable being a landlord yeah. or hiring a management company? And there's all, it's such a, it's a, it's a vehicle of so many opportunities that um, buying makes sense. In, in really any market, people were buying when rates were 15 and 18%. Yes, the values of the homes were extremely lower, but at the same time, they were still buying it. That's, that's what was relative in that moment. So the $50,000 home at 18% was that. And it's no different than today being $600,000 at 5%. Yeah. It's it's what the market is currently. Yeah, it's so. interesting. I don't pay attention to the gas prices at the pump necessarily. Like I feel it when I have to pay it, but like, I'm sorry, I got rid of my bicycle a very long time ago. I don't have another option with as much as I drive and as far as I drive, I got to kind of pay it mortgage rates if they're three percent great if they're six percent and i'm buying real estate as long as i'm getting the best that i can do and it makes sense right like, what else am i going to do i can't force it to go down um sure. the, the other direction so yeah exactly yeah so. good well well mitch i think it's been a fun conversation as we yeah, talk about more yeah it's very prudent given what's happening right now in our environment and um, people shouldn't be afraid of it. They should definitely consider what that means and how it impacts a payment. But definitely don't turn back and go, I'm gonna wait till it goes to three again, because one, it may never. Or two, if it should, then the values of the homes are gonna continue to escalate even further. And now you just backtracked in X amount of dollars in the value of that property, so. Yeah, what a, what a great strategy. I could buy it at 6%. If the interest rates go down to three, the, the other properties around me are probably going to increase like they did. Yep. And I could drop down and refinance down to three and I'm right where they were, but I took advantage <clears throat> of all of that market appreciation. Correct. 
I think that's a great strategy, right? If, if it works if, out if, that way. If it all works out and we had that strategy, we had that timing work out for quite some time, not that long ago. And we, we helped a lot of our clients refinance out of pro, out of mortgages, and get, get out of what's called mortgage insurance and just a, a, a wonderful results in very large savings on a monthly basis by that happening. Yeah. So, and it doesn't mean it won't happen again. I think we're getting set up for something very similar this next couple of years. Yeah. So we'll see. But um, yeah, it was great. Thank you. I love, love talking mortgages and, um, uh, and real estate because it's, it's fun. You can do a lot of things with it and um, you just can't put it in your wallet or your pocket. <laughs> Well, you know, it's a little, little big for the pocket for sure. But, um, you know, love, love the conversation, Mitch. I so appreciate your time as you invest this with us every month. Um, and we'll be ready to go for, for next month. So. Sounds um, good. Yeah. Uh, Thank you again, again. Thanks, Mitch. We'll, uh, we'll see you. You have a, a great week. You do the same. See you soon. All right. Thanks, Matt. Bye. Bye-bye.